Hello, everyone. It's about a minute until the actual start time. Uh, we will start about a minute or two after uh, the start, <clears throat> the, the, the set start time for the session, just to allow folks to come in. Um, but just as a reminder to people, if you do have any questions, please feel free to post those questions in the questions box that's available to you in your GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, feel free to post the questions at any point during the sessions, and I will do my best to answer it during the session. Uh, if I can't get to it during the session, then I will most definitely try my best to get it to it at the end of the session. Also, as a reminder to folks, uh, if you look at your chat window, uh, there's a link there. So in case you are looking for the slide deck, the slide deck is available for download. Uh, you can download it in English, French, or Spanish. So feel free to do so. Uh, if you'd like to get it prior but we will put each session slide deck before uh the session starts so for the session two the slide deck should hopefully be up either by thursday or friday of this week so again we'll start in about two minutes just to give folks uh some time to get it, to get uh connected and get uh, a little bit settled in Hey, welcome everyone to the first session of the Defend and Deliver DMARC Online Bootcamp. My name is Shazad Mirza. I'm the Director of Operations for Global Cyber Alliance, and I'll be your presenter uh, and speaker for the uh, entire bootcamp, actually. So uh, you'll be hearing a lot from me over the next few weeks. <clears throat> um, but just as a reminder before we get started, uh, you do have a questions box that is available to you. If you do have any questions, uh, please feel free to post those questions in that questionnaire box at any point in time throughout the session. I mean, I will be fielding questions if they're if they're present um, and they are relevant to what we're going through and what we're talking about at that point in time. Otherwise, I'll answer those questions at the end. So also just as a reminder in terms of the boot camp as well, uh, we are issuing certificates, but you do need to attend all five se all five sessions for the full duration. Otherwise, you will not get that certificate at the end. All right, so the first session here is going to, we're going to go into is just give you an overview about DMARC and what you guys are going to basically get yourselves into in the over the next uh, few weeks. So, but before we can get into DMARC and talking about DMARC, we need to focus on what phishing is and talk a little bit about phishing because this is something that's very relevant and that's where DMARC is going to, it's going to help protect uh, and hopefully reduce the risks uh, around uh, some phishing attempts. So what is phishing, right? So phishing is going to be your way in uh, where you're basically something is someone is trying to send you an email or some other form of, of communication, but that person is not happy or is not, you know, is not what is that, what is actually supposed to be sent. So like in this case here, the baby's thinking that she's getting pizza, but in reality, she's actually getting baby food and is obviously not happy about it. But in our situation, when it comes to something like some th things like this, right, it's it's kind of the same cause in the same aspect, right? You're getting an email where or 
it could be again some other things right phishing is not just email it can be a text message it can be a voice message it could be a phone call things like that but in this case we're focusing on email but the idea is again the email appears to be something that is either really urgent or something that you need to actually take action on or make changes to or do something along those lines but it's written in that way to make it seem like you have to do it or it's written in such a way that it's actually, it actually appears to be coming from a legitimate source right but what does phishing actually do for you and what does it lead to right it can cause an infection right like ransomware which you've been hearing a lot in the news right ransomware 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 is again i believe lead, if leading if not in at least the top five type forms of attack for 2020 right because your system is getting infected they want some sort of money in order for them to decrypt or give you the key to decrypt and uh, free up all the files and folders that you have on your systems but it can also lead to things like fraud right false wire transfers right you're sending money to places where you shouldn't be sending it to right in that case it's been a little bit less but it's been more along the lines of saying hey make a donation or make you know uh you know please contribute to this fund right especially with everything that's going on right now in, in the world with uh COVID-19 right that's where you see a lot more of those types of emails asking for those donations and making those types of donations or it could just lead to theft of PII right where they're just trying to get your information so that way they can use that information for later attacks right or try to get a username or password in some cases or try to actually get things like your social security information or maybe your tax ID and things like that so they can use that to gain access to other information or just to steal money directly from your accounts and why and if you look at it right phishing is still very successful right phishing is still very prevalent it's still out there and in most cases some years it's increased right and not seeing much of a decrease in many of the years that are coming up but you know, there's more and more that keeps going but it keeps getting through no matter you know we have all your anti-spam filters you have all these different things in place but they're still going through and those those that do get through you're relying on the user to make sure that they understand what's that this is potentially a phishing type message right but they can have some difficulty as well right because they are getting more difficult to understand and more difficult to read because they look more they look legitimate the spelling errors are gone they're written grammatically correct right they have the right images that are being used within the within the uh, message body and not many people actually know to look at the from sender address but when they do sometimes look at the from sender address it could actually be the company's domain name it could be the legitimate domain name and that which is you know is being spoofed but you know when the i mean that's one of the things you train users on look at the from sender address if it's not coming from a trusted source or somebody you don't know then don't respond back or make a phone call or, and such but if it's actually coming from at your company.com that's it makes things much more difficult now now is any standards presentation when cybersecurity, right? There's gotta be some statistics that you put up. So these are some phishing statistics at a global level. Um, so as you can see here, but if you can kind of look at some of the buzzwords or keywords that are popping up, you see things like increase, right? 65% increase in phishing attacks in 2017, 40.9% increase in phishing attacks in 2018, right? And I believe in 2019 is about the same or slightly higher in terms of, the, of what's going on. Then 2020, obviously, there is definitely much more of an increase because of the activity and things that are going on around the world. Now, from the other aspect of it is it's to look at what the dollar amounts are that are involved with this, right? So one of the types of phishing that or type of attacks that involve phishing is BEC, business email compromise, right? So phishing is one form of BEC. There's other types of BEC attacks as well, whereas there's actual email account compromise itself. But overall, as you can see here from the FBI 2019 Internet Crime Report, right, BEC or EEAC, email account compromise, is uh, sixth on the list, where it was 23,775 victims. But look at the dollar amount, right? The dollar amount, $1.8 billion in 2019 were lost because of BEC or EAC type of attacks, right? And this impacts everybody. So it impacts cities. So as you can see here, 80,000 to 1.73 million lost 
by cities. But it impacts anyone because look, a religious institution, right? Who would have thought that attackers would go after a religious institution? Well, they do. They'll go after anywhere, anyone and everyone. Um, so 1.75 million was lost by this religious institution. Right, so they're going after healthcare, they're going after hospitals, especially with a ransomware type of attack. So there's, there, you know, no one is safe from these types of activity. So another thing that you need to understand is the diff there are various types of spoofing. Right, there's various types of phishing, there's various types of spoofing, um, but we want to focus on the spoofing right aspect of it for for this situation. So the first one here you see is display name spoofing. So that's where basically when you get an email from a person, you look at the from address, you see the person's name, or you may see the company's name there. But then when you look behind it, with the actual email address, you see the person's name at yahoo.com or hotmail.com. So this is where you had, you know, you definitely have to train your users to say, hey, look, is your CEO or CFO or is your boss even going to email you from their personal account? They're not. Most likely not, especially when if it's company related type information. Maybe it might be accidental, but they need to still, they should really check with that person using maybe revert to the company email address and say, hey, look, I got this email. Is this legitimate? Did you actually send this? Or pick up a phone and call them. This lookalike domain spoofing, right? So again, you see the person's name, it's a legit name of a person you know, someone you work with, or you know, your boss or someone in your organization. But again, behind the scenes, it says person at, and then something that looks like company.com. But it's not, right? Because instead of an O, they put a zero. Instead of an M, they put an R and an N. So in most cases, when people look at something like this, you know, they may not use the O, but they may just, uh, the, sorry, the zero, but they may actually put an O. But the R and N looks so much like an M, especially if the font is smaller than what you see right here, it's going to be hard to tell that that's actually a lookalike domain. So there's various ways you can, things you can do in terms of lookalike domain spoofing and protecting against that, um, right? You can use anti-spam, anti-phishing filters and put in some, you know, domain, you know, lookalike domains for your domain. You can purchase these types of domains so that way no one else can get them and use them. Um, and then again, let people know, like really take a close look at the, the where it's coming from and read the email and make sure that it's actually something you need to take action on and make sure you actually contact the person first to make sure that this is a legitimate email. But then the last one is domain spoofing. This one is the harder one to take, to have tell, tell users to you know figure out and determine if it's correct. So this is where it actually says the company name or the person's, in, person's name in the company, and then person at company.com, right? So now it's actually using your company name. It's a using a legitimate domain name for your company, one that's actually used in email and for email communications. So now how do you protect against something like that, right? Because if you, you can't use anti-spam and anti-phishing messages or filters because you will end up blocking your company legit company uh, email, right? You can still tell users like, look, you know, instead of you know, paying something that somebody says to pay, call them up to confirm that they're actually supposed to take this action to confirm, make these types of payment. But the thing that you can do, and this is where DMARC comes into play, right? Because DMARC is your way of making sure that your organization's donate, domain name is being protected and not being used in these types of spoofing attacks. So DMARC stands for Domain-Based Message Authentication, Reporting, and Conformance. So what you're doing here is you really have two parts to DMARC, right? So you have a DMARC policy, and that policy is what's going to define as a sender of, message, of these messages using that domain that these messages are being protected. This way, the receiving side will know to check for these types of things, use the authentication mechanisms in place, and to help determine, okay, is this message going to pass or fail the DMARC policy? And then take the, the right action on that message. Right, because there's other forms that you can use and then the recipient has to make a decision themselves, but DMARC allows the sender to define what to do with those messages so the recipient doesn't have to make that decision. But overall, what DMARC is doing is helping prevent spammers and fishers from using an actual organization domain name. 
right? So that way there is no more, there's a reduction in the email fraud, there's a reduction in the types of malware infections and so on, right? But also remember at this point too, this is not only just from a security perspective, there's also a trust component, right? Right, because I mean, if you keep getting spam messages from companies, what do you get end up doing? Right, you get to want to try to unsubscribe, but they keep sending it to you, so you get to mark, start marking them as spam, and that's a problem, right? That's a problem for that company, especially if they're sending legitimate messages. So by using DMARC this way, the the person receiving the message should now know that okay, this is a legitimate message, and this is why I made it to my inbox and not to my spam folder, right? So in a way, DMARC is working on the trust level, right? There's a trust component now that you're building into it. So now your customers have more trust and confidence in what you're doing and what you're giving to them, right? And because you're asking for legitimate information rather than asking this, all these types of fraudulent type information. So therefore, overall, now you're protecting the integrity of your brand. Some additional benefits is that, well, there's a lot of large email service providers for the consumer side that are already implementing DMARC protection or DMARC capabilities on to protect their users. So this we're talking about like Gmail, Hotmail, Outlook, iCloud, Mac.com, and so on. There, these companies have already taken the action of putting in DMARC capabilities to protect them, and so therefore now what it, what needs to be done is the organizational side, right? The businesses need to implement the DMARC policy so that things can be so, so that things can be you know taken into account. That DMARC can be taken into account that in terms of whether these messages are coming in from fraud from uh, legitimate sources or from fraudulent sources. So more than 80% over over worldwide are actually implemented have implemented a, a DMARC verification uh, policy or process on their end. Deliverability is a key component as well, right? Because you really want to make sure your messages get to the end user, to get to the recipient, right? You want citizens or customers to get your messages. And the only way you're gonna be able to do that is to make sure that DMARC is in place at, an, at, a high, at a high enforcement level. And I'll explain later what that means. But what this will do is, is that it's gonna now you know, increase the chances of your messages getting into the inbox. Right, so there's some been some testing and things and such done by some organizations like Agari, where they basically said that there was about a 10% increase in deliverability because of the DMARC policy being put into place. Because so the other thing you have to take into account is again these places like Google, Microsoft, and so on, they are checking for DMARC, but they're also checking other things in, in terms of your domain reputation. And there have been many cases where there have been hospitals, retail organizations. Um, that have not been able to send messages to Google users because Google saw that these messages had high level of spam and their reputation was poor. So what did they have to do? They had to actually implement DMARC. And that's what Google informed them. Implement DMARC and implement DMARC at an enforcement level and then your messages will be considered legitimate at that point unless something else triggers a, a, a different issue. <clears throat> But that's something you have to take into account because a lot of these big vendors have accepted DMARC and they're using, using that as a way of making sure that the messages that are being delivered are accurate. And DMARC is the other thing is that it, it's one of the only ones uh, out there that actually provides some level of invisibility in terms of what's going on the receiving side, right? Because remember with DMARC, one of the components is reporting, right? And that reporting, that reports actually come from the receiving end. So the recipient side, the receiving server, they're the ones who send a report back to you to let you know, hey, look, this is the type of activity we're seeing for your domain name, right? So it's gonna include all the legitimate information and it's gonna include all the uh, fraudulent type of activity, the, spoof, the spoofing and spamming type of activity. But that's something we'll get into a little bit later uh, later on. Um, and also in week five, we'll go into much more details about the report, uh, sorry, week four, we'll go into more details about the reports. So to continue on, so two parts of DMARC, right? You have to remember there's two parts, right? Just because like just like email, it, I mean this is email, but in email there's two parts, right? There's a sending organization and there's a receiving organization. So therefore, DMARC also has two parts. There's the DMARC policy. The DMARC policy is what the sending organization must 
must put into place, right? They need to put that into place. They need to create it. They need to define it, right? No one's going to do that for you unless you have an out like a uh, an MSP or if you have um, like another service email service provider that can actually do this stuff for you. But typically, the organization themselves are responsible for creating the DMARC policy. The reason why is because D the DMARC policy is created in DNS, right? So you're using your existing DNS infrastructure to create that policy, right? Whether it be a Windows system, whether it be Bind, or whether you use a cloud service provider like GoDaddy, HostGator, Network Solutions, and so on, right? That's your DNS. That's where the DMARC policy is going to reside. So in the, in the public DNS system. The other half, right, the remember there's a receiving side. The receiving side needs to implement something called DMARC verification. So that's something they need to turn on. It's not something you create. It's something that's built in to most email security systems. So you may already have this. You just need to turn it on and put that check mark in there. So like Cisco Iron Ports, Mimecast, um, these types of systems have DMARC verification capabilities because it's what so DMARC verification is going to check all incoming messages for a DMARC policy. And if there's a DMARC policy applied to it, it's going to check the sending organization's policy to say, okay, well, how do I handle these messages? What are the authentication mechanisms that I need to check with these messages? So that's re so remember when you do this, <clears throat> you need to do both parts. Our main focus throughout these sessions are going to be on the policy side, not so much on the verification side. And the reason for that is the policy is the same across all organizations, right? The way you implement it, the way you the, 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 the policy is created, the different tags associated with the policy is the same across the board. It's just a matter of you choosing and selecting which ones are the ones you, you how you create the policy. DMARC verification. It's different across all these different systems. It's a matter of just going into these email security gateways, email security systems, and seeing what their capabilities are and what they have. So that's something you'd have to check with your vendor to see and ask them how to actually do it and how to turn it on. So one thing I want to talk about, so you can see this throughout the sessions today, are different DMARC myths. Right? Because, I mean, there are various misconceptions and various concerns when it comes to DMARC. Uh, but one of the things that you need to take into account <clears throat> is that, right, so far I've talked about with DMARC in terms of email, right? So DMARC, one of the misconceptions is, is that DMARC is only for email domains. That's actually not true. You can actually apply a DMARC policy, policy to any public domain, so any public-facing domain. You do not need to apply this to private ones, so internal to your organization. DMARC is for external-facing domains. So whether you use it for email or not, implement DMARC on it, right? Because in some cases, depending on how you set things up, your web domain may not be the same as your email domain, right? That can happen in most cases or for, for some organizations. Some organizations typically use the same, same thing, so that's fine. But in case you don't, like so for example, if we were gca-us.org, and gca-uk.org for our email, but our website is globalcyberlines.org. Well, there's nothing preventing me, or really, you know, from applying DMARC on globalcyberlines.org. I don't have to apply it on just gca-us.org or gca-uk.org, right? Because what's to prevent somebody from using globalcyberlines.org in an email or use it for phishing? Because people will see it and say, well, that is their domain name, so this is most likely legitimate. But we don't use that. We, you know, we do use it for email. You know, hypothetically, we don't we, we don't use that for email. So we should still protect it. We should still apply a DMARC policy on there so that way no one else can use it. So that's gonna be that's very important. That is something you should consider doing. Now there's various things that you need to plan for when it comes to DMARC and things to account. And these are things we're gonna be talking about over the next few weeks. Right, so you need to have an understanding of SPF and DKIM, and I'll explain what that is in the next slide. But we're going to have in week two, we're going to go into much more detail. You need access to your DNS, so you need to know what your DNS policies are. You need to be able to know who your DNS admin is if you're not responsible for DNS, right? And you also may need to know what your change control process is. So how long does it take, you know, for a DNS or this request to get put into place? 
You need to understand the policy levels of DMARC, which I'll again explain a little bit later. Um, you need to determine, do your, does your email server support things like DKIM? You, know, you should have your list of public domains used by the organizations, at least the ones that you are aware of and the ones that you know. But there are going to be obviously things that you don't know, right? Does your organization use third-party vendors? If you know that, great, but you may not know because there might maybe your marketing team or your sales team decide to go ahead and sign up for something without getting IT's approval. You know, then you need to know, do they support things like SPF and DKIM? You know, is there a mail system that IT, other mail systems that IT staff's unaware of, you know, right? Are you, you have a developer team and that developer team is using it to send out test messages. You know, do you, are you aware of those, those types of mail servers? Do you have subdomains? Because that's something you need to take into account be, when, you, when you're focusing on DMARC. So you need to determine for those subdomains, public subdomains, do you need to create a DMARC policy or not? And then you should make sure you're ready for DMARC report analysis. Right, because those reports are going to be very important, but you need to know where you want to send those reports to. So make sure you have an email address ready to receive those reports. So let's talk about a few of these items that I have in place that we wrote here, because I'm sure you have questions on what, what's SPF, what's DKIM, and so on. So let's first talk about SPF and DKIM, right? So DMARC, right? So remember, part of the, the, the DMARC acronym, right? A is for authentication. So what does that mean? So DMARC itself doesn't do the authentication. It uses sender policy framework and domain keys identified mail to do the authentication and authorization for the DMARC policy, right? So these are two things that you should have. You don't, do you have to have both? No, you don't need to have both. Should you have both? If you can, yes, implement both of these because it's only beneficial to you because what do they do? Right, SPF is basically be your policy that says, hey, if the server IP or domain name is not on this policy, then it's considered unauthorized messages, right? So the system, whether it's the IP address or domain name, must be on your SPF in order to be able to send mail using that domain name. Now, there are some issues with SPF. I'm not gonna go into detail into it right now, just for time's sake. Um, We'll talk about those next week in week two. DKIM, DKIM is a digital signature that's being added at the domain level. So it's not something you're adding at the user level, right? So if, you, if people are familiar with things like PGP, right? Like open PGP, PGP, right? The user adds a digital signature to every message that they send out, right? That's a way of showing that this is actually coming from them. Well, DKIM is the same thing. I'm upset that this is signed, this digital signature is on every single message for that domain. So it's not something the user does. It's, this is server side that this is being implemented and, and uh, being done on. So DKIM is adding that additional layer of authentication. So it's good to have both. If you can have both, that's great. Right? If But for DMARC, you need to either have one or the other needs to be in place if not both. I mean, we recommend to have both. If you can, put them both into place. If their vendor allows for both, do them both. But if they don't, it's not a big deal, but at least you have one or the other. The other thing you need to take into account, we mentioned, right, was what are the policy levels, right? DMARC has different policy levels. So I kept saying like DMARC enforcement, right? Uh, so there are enforcement levels and such. So the three levels of DMARC are none, quarantine, and reject. So none is where you're going to start, and you should always start. What none is, is basically putting in DMARC, but it's not enforcing DMARC, right? So none is not an enforcement level. What it means to put the DMARC policy at none is, is basically saying, hey, we're putting ourselves into monitored only mode. What we want to do is we want to collect the reports take a look at the reports and make sure that things are set up correctly, right? We wanna make sure that our authentication mechanisms are set up correctly. We wanna make sure things are passing as they should be and for all the legitimate sources that they're passing and then everything else is, is uh, failing. So once you do that review process of those reports, then that's where you move to an enforcement level of either quarantine or reject. I mean, of course, we're gonna recommend that you should do your best to get to reject 
but there's an understanding that there may be some issues to going to reject, so that's why most people stay at quarantine. But what's the difference between the two? So what happens at quarantine is, is these authentication mechanisms fail, right? So all of them have to fail, not just one. All mechanisms have to fail, then the message is gonna to go to the recipient spam or junk folder. If it's a reject, the message is completely dropped and not delivered at all, okay? So those are the things you have to take into account. This is why we don't readily recommend going, staying at quarantine. Use quarantine as a step, but don't stay at quarantine for too long because what people might see is that if, if a lot of legitimate messages of yours are going to spam, they're gonna consider any actual message that gets to their inbox, probably treat that as spam as well. So you have to be careful on that. So that's why we recommend try your best to get up to reject if you can. But always, always start off at none and then work your way up to reject. So for every organization, it's gonna be different. I wish I could give you just say, oh yeah, you'll get to reject within a couple of days or a couple of weeks. It really, there's a lot of factors that have to be taken into account, like size of the organization, how many subdomains that you have, how many mail systems that you're using, how many third party vendors you're using. Those are things that are going to have an impact and an effect on how quickly you can get from none all the way up to reject. So let's talk about the flow. So how does actually everything work and how when you're doing this and when you're creating all of this? So the first step is you publish your DMARC record in your DNS, right? So the other things, the SPF and DKIM that we talked about, those are actually also gonna exist on your DNS as well. So this is your public facing DNS server that you're putting all this onto. So that has to be done first. Second, the person who's drafting up the messages, they type up their messages and they hit send. You don't need anything special installed on their end in order for DMARC to work, right? All the DMARC things that are going on is all on the server side. So this should be all transparent to them. All right, so the sender just types out their message, hit send, and then it goes off to the sending organization's email server, right? The email server is where it's going to say, okay, here we need to start add on our DKIM signature, right? It may not be the email server. It could also be the email gateway, right? Your, it could be all your, your email gateway can also do, some email gateways can actually do DKIM signatures and DKIM signing. So like Cisco, Ironport, Mimecast, they can actually do DKIM signing for you. Uh, Office 365, they do the signing for you. But either way, but all this is going on in the server side. So this is where the signing happens. This is where the, 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 the data flow is gonna happen. So the IP address of where it's coming, the message is starting, uh, starting from and originating from. The message now goes to the recipient email server. Now remember, right, there's two parts. You have the policy, which was published in the sending organization DNS. Now the recipient side, so on the, either on their server or on their gateway, will have DMARC verification turned on. Now, if verific DMARC verification is not, not turned on, what happens with the message as a DMARC policy? Well, the message just goes through the regular filters, the DMARC policy part is ignored because there's nothing to say to check for the DMARC, for DMARC, right? Because DMARC verification is not turned on, all right? So you want to turn on DMARC verification. Again, also DMARC verification has, is not associated with your policy, so you don't have to do both at the same time. You can actually go in and set up DMARC verification now while you're working on your policy. Okay, so now let's say the recipient's email server or gateway has DMARC verification enabled. So now if they have verification enabled, now it's gonna say, okay, here's a message that has a DMARC policy. We need to go check to see what are the checks, what, what's SPF, what's the DKIM signature, what's the DMARC policy. So it's gotta go through that process before it can start, you know, go through the process of delivering the message. If the message that comes in does not have a DMARC policy, it just goes through the regular filters that you have in place, right? Same with DMARC policy. Even if there's a DMARC policy, it will still go through the other filters that you have in place. So those filters still apply. DMARC doesn't override your filter policies. So just take that into account. So if your message passes, it goes on to the recipient's inbox, right? So SPF, DKIM, one of the SPF or DKIM, all, all these passed, it goes to the recipient inbox. Otherwise, if it doesn't pass, SPF and DKIM, it goes, if it's quarantine, right? 
message is considered a fail and it set, gets sent to spam junk folder. If it's reject, the message is completely dropped and not delivered at all. Right now, but the admin can set it up so that those rejected messages are still stored in like a quarantine folder at the server side, but it won't make it to the recipient's inbox in any way. Then the very last step is, is to send the reports back. So it's the recipient servers that are sending those reports back to you, right? What's, and what's the benefit of that? Well, the recipient knows what's going on, right? They're the ones who are seeing the activity that's going on. So they see any fraudulent or spoofing type messages. They see any of the legitimate messages coming from it. So they are the best ones to tell you. These are the things that we're seeing. So they're the ones who are sending back these reports. Now, just taking account, not everyone send back, sends back reports. Uh, some of them don't, uh, majority of people do, but that's something, again, we'll talk about later on. Uh, but there was one question, just want to make sure that it does actually get answered. So R and DMARC stands for reporting. Are there any good reference to open source libraries capable of processing DMARC reports and conducting some useful analysis? Um, if you actually go to our website, dmark.globalcyberalliance.org, you can see a lot of information there. I, I mean, or just send us an email separately and I can send you some information as well. Because uh, we're not talking about reports until week four. But uh, just so you don't have to wait, just feel free to email me about those questions. So this is what a DMARC policy looks like. So what you're basically doing is in, on your DNS server, you're, you're creating a TXT record. Okay, and then that TXT record, you're defining your DMARC policy. You're giving it a host name and you're giving it a value. So this is just some examples of of, two, uh, of a, a DNS TXT record. We're gonna go into much more detail and break this down. So in terms of the value, break down what, the, what does V equals, P equals, and so on. What does all this mean? We're gonna do all of that in week three of the bootcamp, all right? So we'll break that down for the first hour of each session. And so we can, any questions you have, you can ask those questions during that time. DMARC reports. So this is one thing they get to hear me talk about constantly over and over again. Um, and there's a reason for it because it's trying to get into your heads that these reports are very, very important. You need to get these reports. You need to look at these reports. Grant, this is the time, this is the area that's gonna be the most time consuming. Um, and this is gonna take up most of, of, uh, uh, in terms of getting up to the enforcement level. So getting started with DMARC can be relatively easy getting to the enforcement levels is where it's gonna be very difficult because you have to go through these reports and do some level of report analysis, right? So there's two types of reports. There's aggregate reports and forensic reports. Each one does provide different, different types of information, um, which again, we're gonna go into in, in with uh, week four. Uh, but at this point, the aggregate reports are the ones that you definitely want to get because that's the one that supplies you with the most information. Forensic reports, some people don't send those because there's some privacy concerns and issues with it because the amount of information that it actually provides in the forensic report, because that can actually be the full blown message. Where the aggregate report doesn't give you full, full blown messages, it just tells you where it's coming from. So the IP address of where it's coming from and whether it passes or fails the different authentication checks um, with DMARC. But the reports are very important because it, that, that level of information it provides, right? It's gonna help you determine whether or not you're going to go up to uh, quarantine or reject. It's going to tell you who your spammers and spoofers are, right? It's going to tell you who, what legitimate systems messages are coming from. It'll tell you all the third-party vendors that are in play that are sending messages. So that way you may have to determine, okay, who is using HubSpot? Who's using uh, MailChimp in your organization? And why didn't they let IT know? <laughs> Um, so these are things that you have to take into account um, when it comes to reporting, and this is why those reportings are very are, are good to get. So just take note of that. And typically, when people turn on DMARC verification, that's those are the systems that typically send reports back to you. Um, so just to answer one question really quickly: um, Why is privacy concerned if the messages failed? Uh, privacy is uh, is an issue because that's failed. It's what you're getting back is the full blown failed message. So the message that wasn't delivered to the recipient may pot potentially or may not be delivered to the recipient if you're at the, a level none. But the admin or the person who's reviewing the DMARC reports is going to see that full blown message. 
right? They can, so they can see an invoice. They could see the exact message that was being sent to a person. So that's where there, there might be some level of privacy issues um, and privacy type concerns when it comes to that. So that's why a lot of vendors tend not to send uh, those uh, forensic reports. Uh, so here's an example of an aggregate report. So this is just, you mean it's so aggregate reports, if you recognize this, this is XML, so sensible markup language. Uh, so some of the text you can actually read and you can actually understand some of it, but that's only if the reports are short. So if the reports are lengthy, this is not the best way to read it. Um, it's not a recommended way of reading it. This is an example of a forensic report or forensic or failure report that's out there. So as you can see here, what you, you're basically getting is a full message body. Uh, well, at least in this case, you're just seeing the headers, right? So you're actually seeing um, the authentication results. You see the original recipient too. It's not X'd out. In this case, it, it's been X'd out, um, but it's typically not X'd out. You can see the delivery results. You can see the DKIM signatures. Um, so you can see quite a lot, uh, lot of information in here. Uh, so you can see where it's coming from, who is the reply to is supposed to be to, who the message was supposed to be sent to. Um, I mean, so part of this is cut off, but it can have the subject header, but it can also actually have the message body. And that's where that privacy question, the privacy concern comes into place. So it is actually still coming to someone internal to your organization, but should that person internally to our organization actually see? So that's a question, the big debate around forensic reports right now. So I talked about all the benefits and the you know the good things about DMARC, but I wanna talk about some of the concerns with implementation. Um, so these are some more myths that we're gonna be talking about. So another myth, it's a silver bullet, right? There's no such thing as a silver bullet in cybersecurity, right? It'd be nice, it'd be great. Otherwise, if there was, then we wouldn't be here today. Um, but so DMARC is not the cure to phishing, right? It's not the cure to what's going on. And I mean, it's, it does just one part, right? Right? We talked about the three, three different types of spoofing and only protect against one of the three types of spoofing. So you still need other systems in place. So you still need an email security gateway. You still need those spam filters and anti-phishing filters that they have in there, um, right? So you, it, DMARC is just one layer that you're adding to your email security infrastructure, right? And so you have to take into account those other ones. So think about think about things like Dane, think about things like MTASTS, think about some other ones that are out there. Um, so is Dane and MTS fully implemented today? No, not everyone has adopted Dane completely. Not everyone has adopted MTASTS completely. Um, you know, I know Google supports MTSTS. Microsoft supports both. Um, so the adoption is there. So it's something you may want to consider uh, going through and implementing um, at this point. It's not good for privacy, right? So we did just mention the forensic reports, right? Those forensic reports could be a privacy issue, but it depends on where you're sending the reports to and who are get, who is going to be receiving those reports, right? So you only send those reports to someone internal to your organization. Someone who you know is, you know, is not going to go out and start seeing things about what types of activity and what types of messages that they see, right? So, you know, this is one, you know, GDPR and things like that, it shouldn't be a concern because you have control of where those messages are being sent to. Myth four, it's easy. So it's relatively easy to get started, right? Just to get started, but to get to the enforcement levels of quarantine or reject, that's where it's going to be difficult to get through. For some organizations, it might be easy, right? Because if you're a brand new startup, you just signed up for Office 365 or you just signed up for Google G Suites, that's all you use. Well, for that, that, that type of organization, it's going to be relatively easy to do. But for other organizations, it's going to take some time, right, to making sure that, you know, are we actually using MailChimp? Yes, we are. Okay, let's make sure we get through the process of adding the things correctly to our SPF and our, to our DKIM. You know, are we using Constant Contact? Are we using HubSpot? What are the different third-party systems that we're using? That's gonna take time to go through and, and, uh, and get, get those different things that you need to get into place. So that's where the times are. So it's not, it, 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 is, it can be difficult depending on the size of the organization and where you are within the maturity of your organization. It's going to negatively impact my email. Yeah, it's possible if you don't do things the right way, 
right? Because this is where, again, the delivery rate issue, right? If you if you jump right to reject right away and say, okay, well, you know what? I know my organization. I know our mail system. I'm going to go right to reject. Well, you're taking a chance and you're taking a risk that you could potentially impact your messages and impact legitimate messages. And this has, has happened to other organizations. There was a large financial organization, global financial organization, that did that. They went right to reject because their IT shop was very confident in what they have and what they have set up. Well, lo and behold, about a month or two later, the admin assistant the, uh, for or the executive admin assistant of the uh, CEO could get called IT and said, hey, people are not getting the CEO's newsletter. What's going on? Why are these messages not getting delivered? Uh, so what they ended up finding out was when they actually went through the reports, they said, oh, we're actually blocking it because we didn't add that system that they were using, the third party system that they were using to their authentication mechanism. So therefore those messages were getting rejected. So that's why they went and what they did, they basically dropped back to none, make sure that everything was set up correctly, waited until the next newsletter came out and was then sent out, checked the reports again to make sure that there were no issues, found no issues, and then they went back up to reject. So this is why it's important you start off with none and then make up your way to reject. Don't just jump into reject. You know, start off with none, even if you're a new organization, start off with none just to make sure and then go, go to reject. It's only for large entities. No, it's not, right? It's for everyone. Doesn't matter what size you are. Doesn't matter what maturity level you are. DMARC is for everybody. Everyone needs to implement DMARC. Everyone needs to use DMARC, right? Even if you're a small business, you need to do it. Why? Because again, there's nothing stopping a fisher or spammer or spoofer to go and use your domain name for, for legitimate reasons, or not, sorry, for fraudulent reasons. And it's been seen, we've seen one person shops where their domain is out there and being used. And they're like, wow, why would my domain be used? Well, because it exists and people can use it. So it doesn't matter what size you are, you need to implement DMARC. Anti-spam anti filters are enough. No, they're not, because they're not gonna block at company.com. So if you start putting that in, you're now blocking legitimate messages. Should you use anti-spam filters? Yes, most definitely, you need to use them. But again, right? That's you have to take a security and death process, or uh, uh, when it comes to email security, have everything that you need. Have your anti-spam softwares, have your email security gateways, have DMARC in place, and have those other mechanisms in place as well. Some other concerns end up being things like not enough resources, which can be true, right? Because implementation can be time-consuming, especially if you have a large organization, you have multiple subdomains, right? But what we found that over to what people we've seen is that the resources that are really needed are in terms of the analysis of the reports, right? Because putting in a DMARC record, or sorry, DNS record is not too difficult. It's just going through the reports is something that can take time. Trying to figure out, is this legitimate? Is this not legitimate? You know, who do we ask to determine this? And those things like that. Mailing lists and mail forwarders can also be an issue, right? Because they actually break DMARC. Well, I mean, they don't only break DMARC, they actually break SPF and DKIM. So if you were using those two alone, it can break that as well. And that's just the way the systems are set up. They weren't really meant to do authentication and do authentication properly in the right way. But there's a solution to that. So if you do have mailing lists and mail forwarders, you can set up something called authenticated receive chain, ARC. So if you need more information about ARC, go to arc.spec.org. So if you want more information in terms of run, uh, like return on investment, we did release a report on October 16th of 2018, uh, just indicating based on some of the research and analysis that we did with an independent source. So it was a third party that did it, uh, did the research going through some of the data that we had and some of the data some other organizations had. But overall that they found based on their findings a 19 million to $66 million of annual savings by just implementing DMARC at a level of reject or quarantine. So this is something that you want to consider. Agari also released the report um, around this, a little before ours uh, in 2018, where they went through four organizations of different, of, in different sectors and they did their own uh, ROI of DMARC. 
So they found various and good and in, in, interesting information. So four million increased return on customer engagement, 1.1 million reduced need for customer support, right? Because they're not focusing on spam type of activity. They're focusing on actual things that they need to deal with. Um, 718K reduced cost of cybersecurity insurance and the 10% rise in response rate to email campaigns, right? Because the, deliver the deliverability rate increased because more and more people were getting messages delivered into their inbox rather than going to their spam folders. So this is the first session. Don't go yet. This is a couple more things I want to talk about the bootcamp plan, but here are some resources that are available to you. Um, so there's the DMARC org website which is great because a lot of technical information there the dmark.globalcyberalliance.org if you go to dmark.globalcyberalliance.org there's an image on on that right up front for the dmark boot camp you click on that image that will take you to all the boot camp resources right originally that was for the um the registration page but now we've changed that to where all the resources are going to be located so this includes the slide decks this will include the recordings when they're completed. So you'll get an email with the recording, but you can also go, in case you lose that email, you can go to this website and look at and view the recording there as well. The slide decks will be up and run up on this site uh, the Thursday or Friday prior to the, um, uh, the, the session on the following week. So that the slide decks are in English, French, and Spanish. So feel free to download those prior to the session, so that way if you want to take notes, you can take notes on the, those as well. So just to let you know about the bootcamp plan and uh, what's going on. So obviously now we're in week one. So today was the first session. So there are two sessions, so, so people are aware. So I know in case people, if this time didn't work for you, there is a later session, which is 1 p.m. Eastern, which is 6 p.m. Uh, British time. Uh, and the 6 p.m. British time, 7 p.m. CET time. Uh, so if you want to switch to that one, because that might be easier, if that's fine. Just send us an email and we'll send you the registration link for this that second session instead. Weeks two and three. So the next week, what's coming up? So September 22nd, we're going to talk about SPF and DKIM. We're going to go into more detail with it. So we actually talk about some of the tags. We're not going to go into 100% full detail on SPF and DKIM. Just, we're going to talk about just enough to help you get going with DMARC. Um, then the following week, week three, DMARC in detail. So on, so there's three sessions that week, on the 29th, the 30th, and October 1st. You do not need to attend all three sessions. Just pick which session is more re most relevant to your organization, okay? So if you use Windows DNS, September 29th. If you use something like GoDaddy or HostGator, October 1st. The reason why I'm saying that is because the first half of those sessions is going to be the same exact thing. On each of those days so you can't you're more than welcome to attend all three sessions you're just going to hear the same thing again in the first half it's the last half where i'm actually doing the demonstration so this last half on tuesday i'll show you how to implement dmark spf dkim using windows dns and i'm going to use office 365 as my basis wednesday september 30th again office 365 but on a bind server so your linux dns and then on Thursday, October 1st, we're still using Office 365, but I'm going to be actually using Google Cloud DNS and uh, Ionis 1 and 1 to show you how to create it. I mean, it's pretty much going to be the same when you, if you use GoDaddy and any of these other types of systems. So take that into account when you're doing this and when you're going through. So you are mo you're welcome to come through and sit through all three. Um, if you're not sure which one, like, because if you're attending this and you're not working or you're not within an organization, uh, I'd probably recommend attend the Linux one, um, but again, you can attend all three or just maybe join in the last half of it. But at least one of them, you have to attend the full session in order to get the, the, the uh, credits for the um, certificate. Week four, we'll talk about reporting. And then week five is just going to be a wrap-up session. So we'll just do a very quick review and then talk about a few other protocols that are out there like Dane, MTSTS, Vimy, and Arc. We're not going to go into full detail but give you enough information to get again to get you aware of what they are and what are some of the things that are involved with it. Um, but again, in order to get that certificate, you do need to attend all the sessions. Sorry, you need to attend five sessions. So week one, 
obviously, so if you full for the full duration, so week two, right, September 22nd, week three, pick one of the three. That counts as one. So if you tend to all three, yet yeah, technically we'll give you we'll give you additional credits, but only one is required. So right, that's your third credit. Week four is your fourth, and week five is your fifth credit. All right. So hopefully that I, that makes sense. So I want to make sure that that, that things are going. Uh, at, you know, the people attend correctly and attend it. But you have to attend the full session. It can't be for 20 minutes. Can't be for five minutes. You have to attend the full session for over each week, so five total, in order to get the certificate of completion at the end. So at this point, we have about six minutes left. I'm gonna go back and see if I can answer some of the questions here. So companies with a well-inhabited male domains are reluctant to experiment with DMARC. What would be the recommendation strategy other than policy none to get started with the DMARC journey? Is the use of the subdomains a viable option? What else can be thought of? So yeah, okay. So other than policy of none, none is actually what would be, would be the recommendation. That's actually the best thing to start with because then that way you can see what types of things are going on and you're not impacting male in any way. Um, if you have subdomains and those subdomains are being used for mail, then yes, start off with the subdomains. You know, maybe start off with a subdomain that sends the least amount of messages. Start off with that just to, if you wanted just to see how DMARC works, um, you know, and how it, how it, how it's impacting that. But I mean, we can tell you overall that DMARC has had a tremendous impact in terms of uh, making things better for the organization. Right. I mean, there's there, I used to have slides here in terms of some quotes. So just to give you an example. Um, so if you've heard of HMRC in the UK, right, Her Majesty's Revenue and uh, Customs, they implemented DMARC. They ended up blocking about 300 fraudulent messages. No. Oh, so I want to make sure I get it right. So I think it's over 300,000 fraudulent messages in a year. They blocked Aetna, which is a large healthcare organization. Uh, or insurance company, Aetna, they ended up blocking about 60 messages per month or more, 60 to 100 messages per month, something like that, um, on, a, on, a, on a monthly basis. So, I mean, there is a big success rate in terms of doing that. So, I mean, if you have subdomains, start off with a small subdomain and then work your way up from there. That might be the best thing for you to consider doing. Um, so yeah, so with reports, only some service centers, is it difficult to get good statistics about spoofing? Uh, not really. I mean, because I mean, the way I see it, I mean, you're not going to get complete the complete picture. Yes, that's correct. You're not going to get the complete picture, but you're still going to get a good amount, right? Depending on who you send it, the messages to. Um, you know, like Google will send reports bank back. A lot of banks re send reports back. Um, a lot of government entities send reports back. So you know, it's best to do that and just look at what it is and go with what what you're seeing uh so there's a question about exchange 2013 and does not enable support dkim uh yes there is this, uh there's something called uh, of course i can't remember it now uh we are definitely going to talk about it in next week i'm going to uh and then in week three i'm actually going to show you how to implement it on the windows dns session uh, i believe it's called dkim exchange it's something that you can get you can uh you can get off of GitHub. It's free to, to use, free to install, uh, and set up on your on your on your Exchange servers. Only thing is, you have to you have to install it in every single Exchange server in order for it to work correctly. Yeah, with Arc, I'm not going to go into details with Arc. Um, the Arc working group tends to keep Arc close knit to themselves. Um, so my recommendation would would be is if you have a lot of if you have questions about ARC, you may want to check out the ARC working group. Um, going back here, so arc-spec.org, that's the people there and you can ask them more details if you want detail level of implementation. So in terms of the rest of the session, so when you registered for the first session, that actually registered for you for all five sessions. 
Um, so you're, if you registered for the, and you got into this using GoToWebinar, you're automatically registered for each one too. So an hour before each session, you should get an email reminder letting you know that the session is about to start. Just make note that it's called DMARC Bootcamp. We, weren't on, we were not able to uh, name each session individually. It was a limitation on the, uh, excuse me, the tool that we're using. So if you in session, if you sign up for the first session, then you act, you, you're you're good to go for all the other sessions. For domains that do don't send receive email, can we set the reports to go to a different email domain? Uh, you can do that. There are some restrictions on where you can send them to, um, and there's some additional steps you have and actions you have to take in order to be able to send to those domains. Um, so send me a separate email and I'll give you the instructions on how to do that. So that way you don't have to wait um, for, a, I think it's session four or week four that I talk about it. So it can email me now instead of waiting till later. So DMARC should be implemented on all organizations' domain, not just those with the MX records. Yes, for all public domains. Right, so I want to make sure that's clear because people have done it for private domains and it caused issues internally. Any public facing domain, you should implement DMARC. So, yeah, someone make a recommendation. The, U the UK Cybersecurity Center and CSC has some good. DMARC resources. In fact, I'm going to say they have some great DMARC resources. Um, the UK government was one of the first governments to take initiative to have DMARC and implement, have government organizations in the United Kingdom implement DMARC. So I give them a lot of kudos on what they do, what they've done, and what they're doing, and a lot of their capabilities. Um, so thanks for that resource. We'll add that resource to the uh, the DMARC Bootcamp resources page. So again, next session is next week, September 22nd. Um, so again, we have the two times, 8 a.m. Eastern and 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, let me put my email address out there so that way in case anyone has any questions or if there are questions I wasn't able to get to, feel free me to send me an email directly. Because um, there are some questions, one question, so tell us a little bit about your organization adoption rate of DMARC. So with Global Cyber Alliance, so if people are interested, I'll go a little bit over time. Um, but otherwise, this you know, if you don't have the time, feel free to drop off. You're going to get full credit as long as you stayed on for the full one hour. But now we're over one hour. But just really quickly, um, so for GCA, we implemented DMARC in 2016. Um, we only had G Suites at the time, and maybe mail ser mail server. Uh, Survey Monkey at the time. So it was a little bit easier for us to go through the process. We actually started off with quarantine uh, and stayed with quarantine for actually a little bit uh, longer than I we probably should have. Um, and then we jumped up to reject probably about six months later uh, and implemented uh, reject. So at this point, we're at reject. And we did we have some difficulty with some stuff? Yeah, we did. Um, it's, especially when we started adding more third party vendors into the mix. Uh, some third-party vendors only supporting SPF, some some only supporting DKIM, but we were still able to do it and get everything going and everything went through. Um, again, the hardest part was to review the DMARC um, reports because initially when we were small, we weren't sending out many messages, so it was easy to handle two or three reports on a daily basis. But long-term, when we hired more and more people and we're sending sending out more and more messages, it did become a little bit more difficult. So you know. This is where I eventually will, you know, we do recommend using some sort of the other free online services um, or maybe consider using one of the vendors for that uh, type of activity. So just, again, this is a very quick overview of what we, how we went through. But for us, it did take us a couple months because we were still also learning everything at the same time. Um, so for the other classes, yes, all the other classes at the same time. So it's Tuesdays. Tuesdays, 8 a.m. and 1 p.m. So whichever one you registered, you should get an email an hour before. Actually, you should get an email a day before and an email an hour before about the session. So that way you have that reminder coming up in case you don't have it uh, saved on your calendars or anything like that. So thank you, everyone. 
if you have any questions, please feel free to email us questions. We're here to help you get started, get through the process. We hope that people who do not have a policy in place will actually implement DMARC throughout the process, throughout this boot camp. Remember, you get extra three credits if you do so um, by the end of the boot camp. So feel free to email us any questions at any point in time. Go to the DMARC website, our dmark.globalcyberalliance.org website. Go to that link on the on the on the left on the right hand side to look for all the resources, the slide decks, and the recorded videos. So thank you everyone, and we'll see you next week.